Hello, my name is Matias Cavodi. I'd like to welcome you guys to my channel. Today, we're talking about The List, which is sort of a crossover. It's not really. It's weird. It takes place across a bunch of Marvel's main titles, where it's trying to establish a new status quo in the Marvel Universe during the Dark Reign. And uh, some there's some pretty interesting changes, and some writers take some interesting risks and new ideas in these stories. And... Uh, I Me, mean, at least for myself, I really like the Dark Era, Dark Era, the Dark Reign era of Marvel. It was really good. Where we had Norman Osborn becomes the head of Shield. This happened after the Secret Invasion. Uh, he takes control of the Avengers team, the Dark Avengers. He has also the Thunderbolts. Most of Marvel's heroes have gone underground or on the run, and um, he establishes this list to take down. All the heroes that he sees to be liabilities and problems for his future plans. And uh, without further ado, let's get into this. And let's see how. I don't know how many issues I'm going to cover of the list. If it gets too long, I might do two videos. But the first one is the Avengers tie-in, where we have Hawkeye. He's in his Ronin persona, so we have like a more dark and gritty Hawkeye. He's more pissed off. Uh, he's not the the fun-loving, idealistic Hawkeye from the West Coast Avengers. Or from the Thunderbolts, who had serious issues with killing, <laughs> and in this case we have Hawkeye. He can't. He he just can't tolerate Norman Osborn being in the Avengers Tower, being the head of Shield. It basically decides to go on a suicide mission to kill Norman Osborn. As I said before, I've read West Coast Avengers. Old school Hawkeye had real issues with killing, and so it just feels really out of place. But even more out of place that he's talking, discussing the fact of killing Norman Osborn with Mockingbird, which back in West Coast Adventures, they had a big fight and led to Mockingbird leaving the team over a murder of a guy that raped her. And so it just feels really weird. Like Mike, Brian Michael Bendis read, wrote this particular tie in. He gave. Or he didn't have any idea of that took place in, 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 con in Marvel continuity, or he just didn't care because, especially, this dialogue just feels really out of place. So, outside of just feeling really weird seeing Hawkeye going on the suicide mission to straight up kill a guy, just a little bit feels a little bit out of character, but okay, he's Ronin, he's darker, he's more angry at this time. Uh, the rest of the story is actually pretty fun because it's it does illustrate how much of a badass Hawkeye is and his capability as a strategist and how he's, he takes down each one of the members of the Dark Avengers one by one. So he throws Mac Gargan, who's Venom, Venom out of a window. He breaks into his room, throws him out because the Dark Avengers are stationed in Avengers Tower. Then he takes down Bullseye, who is the, was the new Dark Hawkeye during that time. Shoots him down. <laughs> like... Bullseye, I've seen him, he take, like he's a normal guy, I've seen him been shot so many times, stabbed, it's like, it's really weird to see a normal guy, he has no superpowers, he always survives, but Hawkeye shoots him point blank, takes him down, he brutally, brutally defeats Dakin, Wolverine's son, he shoots an arrow right through his head. This is cool to see the, the acknowledgement. Moonstone used to be his girlfriend back in the Thunderbolts, so they have a little chat that that I did enjoy that Bendis recognized this particular situation. And when Hawkeye arrives to kill Norman Osborn, Ares, the god of war, pretty badass character, easily disposes of Hawkeye, takes him down, he's defeated and captured. And Norman Osborn decides not to kill him. He realizes he may be an asset to use further down the line, so he captures Hawkeye. Then we have the Daredevil tie-in to the list. Where I'm not much of a Daredevil fan. I'm, I've read very few Daredevil comic books. And uh, so I don't know what was the situation prior to this or during this time, but... This particular tie-in sort of establishes the basis for the Shadowland crossover, which was a pretty fun crossover, where Daredevil becomes the head of the Hand, and he gets corrupted by an evil demon, the, one of the demons that 
was behind the hand, and all of Marvel's main street heroes have to take him down. And this story is what happens is Norman Osborn authorizes Bullseye, who's Dark Hawkeye, to go to Hell's Kitchen and take down Daredevil once and for all. And um, so we have an initial battle that ensues between Hawkeye, Hawkeye and Bullseye. And Bullseye, he's such a cool villain. And he, he's like one of, he's one of my favorite insane psychopath villains out there. And what he does is such he's such a dick move. There's a, there's a building that I'm trying to get the people out of, uh, evict the people from that building. And there's a whole situation. They're all poor in Hell's Kitchen. So while this battle is going on, Bullseye loaded this building full of explosives and blows it up with everyone inside of the building. It's a really fucked up thing to do. And he tells Hawkeye, every time we battle, you don't take me down. It's your fault that all these people die because you're too soft and you're a pussy. <laughs> it's freaking brutal. And Daredevil realizes this whole situation. He could have stopped it if he would have stopped Bullseye once and for all. He, and he takes responsibility and this pushes him to become the new leader of Hand. Establishing, establishing the Shadowland in Hell's Kitchen and establishing like a whole new era for street heroes during that particular time, ending with the Shadowland crossover. That was it was pretty fun. It wasn't the deepest crossover ever, but it was pretty interesting. Then we have the X-Men tie-in. Namor, after the Utopia crossover, becomes one of the X-Men. It's pretty interesting, the whole situation with Namor on the X-Men. So what Norman Osborn decides to do is resuscitate or bring back for the dead Namor's ex-wife, uh, Marina. She was part of like of this alien race called the Plodex. I always thought it was Polydex, but no, it's Plodex. Which these aliens can are sort of metamorphs and can turn into monsters. So he bioengineers his ex-wife into the sea monster and sets her out to the sea to kill as many Atlanteans as possible. And she's freaking powerful. Like she's a pretty much a powerhouse. So Namor's having to deal with the death of the Atlantean people. So since he's working with the X-Men, they try to help him deal with this whole situation. And also, here we start to see the basis of the relationship, this messed up relationship between Emma Frost and Namor. Where Namor can't help on hit, but hitting on <laughs> other people's wives or, or girlfriends. And she's blonde, so he starts hitting. There's like a lot of sexual tension between Namor and Emma Frost that this is going to have repercussions in the um, Avengers vs. X-Men crossover. Oh, and I forgot to mention, in the previous story, the Daredevil one was written by Andy Digley, and this X-Men one was written by Matt Fraction. So, the X-Men are able to deal with Marina. There's a sad, touching moment where Namor actually has to kill his ex-wife, and he has these memories of all the happy times they had together. Goes to Norman Osborn and tells him, don't fuck with me again. I killed my ex-wife. I can do far worse to you. So that was like a badass moment for Namor. Then we have the Secret Warriors tie-in. That was written by John, uh, by Jonathan Hickman. I was really surprised to see that. I didn't remember he had wrote, written for the series or this one shot only. Ed McGinnis is the artist. And in this particular story, actually Nick Fury teams up with Norman Osborn to investigate... Um, the sleeper spy that was in Washington or something like that. And what we discover at the end of the issue is obviously Nick Fury screws Norman Osborn over. This is going to lead to the uh, Thunderbolts series going, where the Thunderbolts go after and try to kill Nick Fury. That was a pretty good story. But Namor, uh, Namor, uh, Nick Fury is able to get get away with this information they they wanted to extract from this dude, and what we discover is the existence of Leviathan, because there was Shield, there was Hydra, and there was actually a third group of super spies in Russia called Leviathan, and that particular story arc within the Secret Warriors was really awesome. So, and the Secret Warrior series was fucking solid. It was really good. The list, Hulk. Here we have. Hulk romping around the world with Scar. This character I never cared much for. Um, this does build into the World War Hulk uh, 
uh, crossover further down the line because Hulk had lost his powers to the Red Hulk, got his powers absorbed, and in and in a, in a battle against Moonstone, who was Miss Marvel during this time, and Victoria Hand, Bruce Banner gets irradiated, and because of the situation, he's going to become Hulk again. So we're going to get that epic battle at the end of World War Hulk's where we have Scar Sun battle against Hulk because Scar Sun doesn't wants to take vengeance on the Hulk not in Bruce Banner so he's trying to assure that Bruce Banner becomes Hulk again so that happens there then we have the Wolverine tie-in where we have Wolverine teaming up with Phantom X and Marvel Boy <laughs> this is a really weird team up like Wolverine and Phantom X no because they're going to be on X-Force together but with Marvel Boy where Norman Osborn wants to infiltrate the world where it's like this bio place where they bioengineer the these super living weapons part of the Weapon X Weapon Plus program which was part of Weapon X it's sort of complicated so Wolverine and Marvel Boy team up to go and stop Norman Osborn from the, doing that and they have they end up teaming up with Phantom X. So this is actually a pretty interesting and weird story. It was written by Jason Aaron, where we have the introduction. I can't remember if it was Weapon 15 or Weapon 16, but it's just a really weird concept of uh, manipulating people through the belief in religion and happiness and stuff like that. So it's a really offbeat but interesting story. But what happens at the end of this one is that Phantom X steals from Dr. Doom a reduction rate, he shrinks down the world to this little, little pod and keeps it to himself so no one can get their hands on this. And we have also established, established the return of Deathlock in his final pants. Then we have the Punisher tie-in, which this one is awesome. Like all these stories, I enjoyed them all, except for the Hulk one. I think it was like the, the weakest, where Norman Osborn wants to take down Punisher once and for all. And he goes down with the full force of Hammer and sends Dakin after Punisher. And the battle between Dakin and Punisher is just brutal. It's just fucking epic. And, um, like, I didn't like, I imagine Punisher fans being sort of pissed off. Like, you have a second rate Wolverine taking down Punisher. And, uh, but Punisher further down the line gets vengeance on Dakin but I really imagine also the Punisher fans not liking the whole Franken castle because Punisher gets killed in the story by Dakin he goes down swinging like the battle's fucking epic it's it's really good John Romita Jr.'s art is really good and um, and this story is actually written by Rick Remender but the whole Franken Castle thing that leads comes after this, using the Bloodstone to bring Frank Castle back. I imagine a lot of both Punisher purists might be really pissed off because they, Punish is more like a grounded character and stuff like that. So seeing him in a more superhero or metaphysical or or uh, uh, in a fantasy uh, aspect of this character, probably they didn't like that too much. And in the final issue, we have Spider-Man going up against Norman Osborn himself as Iron Patriot. Spidey is able to download information, recordings of genetics experiments, illegal ones, obviously, by Norman Osborn. And he plans to publish them to the world. We get a pretty kick-ass battle. This is written by Dan, Dan Slott and illustrated by Adam Kubert. This is a pretty good story, and the whole showdown between Norman Osborn and Peter Parker, because Norman Osborn doesn't remember that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but he sort of has some of his suspicions during this time, and the showdown, like the battle between, with him and Spider-Man is really good, but this part is really well written. I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was a wasted opportunity when the Dark Reign, Dark Reign ended with the Siege of Asgard, crossover we didn't get a final showdown between spider-man and iron patriot like they sort of set up the whole situation here and we don't see it explode at the end of that crossover i thought that it was spidey it was like that crossover was really solid i really enjoyed it we didn't get to see this spidey take down the iron 
Iron Patriot. That would have been really cool. So I'm going to leave this video here. It was a freaking mess. But these list tie-ins, crossovers, I don't know how to call them. They're really good. They really set the tone for their time and build up some pretty interesting stories all out of all these series. So see you guys next time. Bye.